Uh, sorry, this is an English seminar. <laughs> My name is Jonas Söderqvist. I work at the Swedish Labour Movement's Archives and Library at the Research Department. And I will be some sort of technical host today. Uh, and it is Matthias Kajovita who will be the proper host. And I hope that uh, I see a few attendees have, have joined us. Um, if you uh, would like to contact us during this uh, or ask any questions, you can use the raise hand. Um, function in Zoom or write to us in the chat. Um, and I I don't know if we should start. It's just um, maybe we should start, Matthias. Yes. I leave the floor to you. Okay, thank you very much and thank you, Jonas and uh, also the Nordic Labour History Network for the invitation to present this new book that we have launched or in January this year with the title, well, it is a Swedish book that has the title Klasskamp på svenska, aktörer, idéer och erfarenheter i 1900-talets Finland, svenska arbetarrörelse. So freely translated to English, it's class struggle in Swedish, um, and uh, we are going to have this book presentation in English. Uh, I'm one of the editors of the book. My name is Matthias Kajhovirta and I'm a project researcher at Åbo Academy University, a historian currently working on a project on Finland Swedish anti-fascism. Um, together with me, I have also three of the writers in the book. Um, Alexi Hohta and Mats Wikström and Jasmin Nyqvist, who will give their own presentations of their each book chapter in the book. So I will now give you a brief introduction of the book. And uh, to start with the sort of background story, uh, I wanted to move you there. So the background story of this book is that it's part uh, or the outcome of a research project that we had it in at Åbo Academy University. The research project's title was almost the same as the book Class Campus Svenska. You can see it over there in the PowerPoint, but freely translated to English, it was Class Struggle in Swedish Language and Identity in the Swedish Speaking Labour Movement in Finland in the 20th century. And this research project was funded by Connect Foundation in Finland. And well, the research period, the time period when we conducted this research was between the years 2016 and it's ending this year in 2022, but mainly, well, the most active research years was between 2016 and 20. Uh, the project leader of the pro this research project was uh, Professor Holger Weiss, professor in general history at Åbo Academy university and the researchers involved was uh, Jonas Alskog, uh, doctor in philosophy, and then Alexi Hohta, me myself, and um, Jasmin Nyqvist, Anna Sundelin, and Mats Wikström. All of us are historians, except of Jasmin Nyqvist, who is a PhD student in uh, the study of literature, but all, all researchers uh, appointed at Orb Academy. And then also we had uh, a couple of research assistants, Johan Erstedt, Patrick Hetula, Christopher Holm, and Emil Kaukon, and all of them PhD students who have assisted us during the research process. Uh, the basic idea for, of the research project was to study the sort of unwritten history of the Finland Swedish order, Swedish speaking labor movement in Finland. And as you might know, Finland is a bilingual country with uh, both Finnish and Swedish speaking Finns, while the Swedish speakers are a minority. Uh, today, there are some 6% of the total population who speak Swedish as the main uh, mother tongue. And uh, uh, we were interested to study the, the small Swedish speaking labor movement that was active in the early 20th century. Uh, theoretically, we wanted to study the intersection of class, language, 
and identity and uh, ethnicity in the bilingual Finnish labor movement, and also how class and class struggle and socialism was a part of the making of the Swedish uh, speaking ethnic minority in Finland, part of this sort, sort to say minority nationalist project that we call Finland Swedishness. Uh, the project, the research questions addresses the previous international history and also current historical research on what has been called the so somewhat troublesome relationship between uh, socialism and nationalism. And we have taken this, this research uh, also to our own uh, research areas. Some of the research uh, outcomes, if you look at the sort of scientific knowledge that we have produced is to show the significance of ethnicity and ethnic identity in the history of the labor movement and especially in the seemingly ethnic homogeneous Finnish society. Uh, and also how this, what we call the Swedish speaking minority nationalism seamlessly was also integrated in the class struggle uh, in the in the labor movement history. So the outcome of the project has also uh, resulted in several research articles, book chapters, presentations, both on conferences and for gen for the general public, some teaching, uh, also supervision of master and doctoral theses. We have gained some media attention, uh, and also for the individual researchers, scholars. Uh, have also been research fundings. And um, right now we have also in the, so to say, the pipeline, uh, Finnish uh, research anthology that is uh, a Finnish in, in Finnish language, where we also present uh, some of the research results from the project. So if you look at the uh, uh, aim of this book, this consists of six case studies of six different individuals uh, that were engaged in the Swedish speaking labor movement in the first half of the 20th century. Here you will see also a, a picture of the front cover of the book. Uh, and methodologically, we have made up but these articles are kind of a combination of biography, social and micro history, the hist study of history of ideas and also literature studies. And the aim of this each chapter is to study a person. So a sort of a prism to illuminate the lived experience and the use of ideas of socialism and class struggle in Swedish speaking Finland. Um, this book sort of attempts to narrate a new historical perspective on the history of Swedish speaking Finland from a class and a socialist perspective, and also to give new angles on Finnish labor history. So the contents you can see here in the pictures, the Swedish uh, titles for each chapter. Uh, I will give you just a short uh, presentation of them. The first is written by me is an introduction that presents the general problems, the uh, research questions that we have in this book. Uh, the first main article is written by Alexei Hulta about Koji Venman, and he will shortly give a, uh, a presentation of his own book chapter. And then also Mats Wikström will present his chapter on Alan Asplund. Anna Sundelin has written an article on Ragni Carlson a female socialist politician uh, who uh, Sunderland studies the very interesting relationship between Swedish speaking smallholders and socialism. That is a kind of interesting topic during this, uh, this era also. And in my own article, I study the Finland Swedish social democratic politician Karl Harald Wik. Uh, and his uh, war resistance during the Second World War. And I'm kind of analyzing his war resistance as a part of the anti-fascist and socialist internationalist discourses and ideas during, during uh, this time period. And Jonas Alskog studies Artos Virtanen, uh, 
who was uh, also a leading Swedish speaking social democratic politician who went over to the uh, People Democratic League, that is sort of the left socialist movement uh, in Finnish, uh, Finnish political uh, history. And he studies uh, the social democratic visions of unifying the divided Finnish labor movement. And then the last chapter is written by Jasmine Nyqvist uh, about the organ, and Jasmine will also present her chapter uh, later on. So uh, the program that will follow is that next up we have Alexi who will present his chapter and then we will continue with Max. And uh, the last presentation is then given by Yasmin. And after all these presentations, I think there will be some time for uh, questions and comments from the audience. So please, Alexi, you can start whenever you are ready. I'm going to stop sharing now. So. Yes, thank you, Matthias. I will just share the screen. Um, um, and then the slideshow play from start. Okay, can you see these slides? Yes. Yeah, great. Okay, so yeah. Um, so uh, my chapter in this in this book is on, uh, like Matthias mentioned, it's it's on uh, Karl Johan Benman, um, who was a um, social democrat uh, politician um, in the 1930s, 1940s, um, and he originated from the um, Ostrobothnia region of of um, Finland. And I just realized that I should have probably included a map here, um, but uh, the Ostrobotnia region is the, it's the west, western coast uh, of, of Finland and the, the Swedish speaking areas there um, are the, the coastal, coastal uh, uh, regions north and south of the city of Vasa. And Benman came from this rural uh, Swedish speaking, very Swedish speaking um, um, society. And in my article, I sort of try to um, use Benman as a, as a, as a prism uh, through which to look at the um, uh, um, uh, radicalism, uh, um, left-wing radicalism um, in these uh, rural areas of, of Swedish Ostrobotnia in the, in the especially in the 1930s, um, 1940s, and into the post-war period. And uh, the, the title of my uh, uh, chapter is the um, freely translated uh, The Peasant Socialist Koyi Venman's Political Life uh, During the uh, Ostrobotnia's um, Years of em Emigration. And um, those of you how, who are not familiar with um, with the region, um, it's um, it's a quite distinctive uh, um, region. It has, um, especially the Swedish-speaking areas in Ostrobotnia, have all, always had a, a quite close connections to Sweden, uh, linguistically, culturally, uh, commercial links, and so on. But also, uh, it, it's the region where mo most of the um, 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 immigrants to North America in the late 19th century, early 20th century um, in Finland uh, originated. So it's a heavy emigration region. And in the uh, post Second World War period, it was a heavy region of emigration to Sweden. So what I'm interested in the chapter is to look at the, the sort of the um, Venman's political life um, in this context of emigration uh, because uh, emigration in different ways uh, shaped also the life of, of Wenman. He was a son of a former uh, immigrant to the United States. Um, he himself uh, migrated uh, to the United States during the First World War when there was um, a lot of uh, 
my migration uh, from from Narpes, where where he uh, came from, uh, to the United States, um, um, and uh, much of this immigration was uh, the immigration of young men who were afraid of being enlisted into the Russian army um, um, in, in the fall of 1916 there were all these rumors that uh, also Finnish males uh, could be constricted constricted to the uh, Russian army and uh, Venman was one of the one of the um, young men who, who decided to uh, leave Finland to escape this draft and he went to the states where he worked as an as an uh, uh, indifferent uh, jobs, but mainly as mi as a miner in in the upper upper Midwest. Um, and when he came back in in the in the early 1920s, and when he became really active in in uh, radical politics in the 1930s during the years of the Great Depression, this was a period when a lot of um, labor migrants who were moving who were had went to the United States or Canada, were moving back uh, to, to Astrobotnia. And many of these young men and women had been uh, radicalized in the Depression era, United States and Canada, and they brought these ideas of, of, of uh, radicalism of, um, uh, and communism to, uh, to Astrobotnia. And when man started to cooperate with them and with their support, he was elected to the parliament and uh, um, and um, and then uh, in the in the uh, post war years um, um, many of his own children uh, moved uh, to Sweden uh, as part of this greater migration to the uh, to Sweden so um, this history of immigration in many different ways uh, shaped uh, his his own life, um, and I the 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 sort of the goals that I one of the goals main goals of, of that I have in this article is to uh, look at the ways in which this experience of of being himself an immigrant and being shaped by this society um, of emigration, how it uh, influenced his, his political thinking, political um, um, activities, um, and so on. Um, uh, but I, uh, I'm also interested in uh, uh, to study uh, this, this um, rural uh, radicalism in, in Austrobotnia and uh, specifically the left-wing variant of, of radicalism in, in Astrobotnia, because it, it is a subject that has, uh, uh, there's been, not been much research on it. Um, um, so, um, so that's also something that I try to do in this article is to bring in uh, Astrobotnia to the uh, sort of the general picture of um, Swedish-speaking uh, radicalism um, and socialism in, in early 20th century Finland. Quickly, um, right, I, I could, yeah, so, um, I devote one one section of my of my article uh, to the uh, um, Venman's years in the United States. Um, as I mentioned, he he went there in 1916 during the First World War, um, and he was there uh, um, about four years. He he came back uh, 1920. So, um, and he worked uh, uh, jobs at at mines and uh, for example in 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 the uh, mining town of Boots, Montana uh, which was a uh, city that had a quite large um, uh, uh, 
following of the syndicalist uh, organization Industrial Workers of the World, and they organized a great strike there in 1917 when when Venman was there, and uh, later on in life he he uh, uh, sort of attributed his uh, political awakening to to being part of this strike. So he basically found these uh, socialist ideas there, but he also um, because during the time that he was there, uh, United States also entered the First World War in April 1917. And uh, he, uh, because he, then became afraid that he was going to be drafted to the U.S. Army, so he started to evade authorities, their drafting authorities, and this also was uh, sort of a uh, key experience in his life. And later on, when, for example, in the late 1930s and and, and 1940s, when he was involved in helping um, refugees, Jewish refugees from Germany, he um, uh, uh, sort of explained his 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 uh simple in kind of an uh, uh foreigner who 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 uh was also an outlaw uh in 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 the United States and trying to evade authorities and um when he was in the states he also uh uh or the First World War was also a time uh, of sort of the shaping of the Finland-Swedish uh, socialist organizations in the United States and uh, uh, specifically the town of Boots, Montana, where Venman was, uh, became, became a center of Finland-Swedish immigrant uh, radicalism. Um, and they uh, started to contrib contribute uh, writings, for example, to the Swedish American uh, socialist press and so on. So um, in, a, in a quite interesting, interesting way, uh, Venman uh, uh, became uh, acquainted with uh, uh, Finland Swedish, specifically Finland Sp Swedish radicalism in, when he was a migrant in the United States. Um, um, and Right. So, yeah. So, in my article, I, I'm interesting in interested in the ways in which these uh, um, experiences of of um, being an immigrant um, um, uh, uh, shaped his 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 um, political activities and political thinking. I mean. Um, one of the great causes that when one fought for when when he was in the in the parliament was was the the peace question he was a quite devoted pacifist um as i mentioned he he was involved in helping the refugees jewish refugees um, um during the second world war and so on and but also um in the post post war Second World War period, uh, when there was when there was this great uh, emigration to Sweden, uh, Benman became also quite involved in uh, different kinds of campaigns to sort of uh, uh, um, uh, resist uh, uh, resist emigration uh, because he was afraid of afraid of um, uh, that uh, Ostrobotnia would lose all its young men and women, and he was afraid for uh, for the future of this uh, rural society in in and and peasant society in the, uh, in Ostrobotnia. So he was involved in different kinds of projects to bring industrialization and in industries um, um, to Ostrobotnia to um, resist this emigration and. Um, also, this uh, I argue in my article. Uh, um, this uh, sort of criticism towards um, emigration was also something that he he uh, took away from his own experiences of of being of uh, having to leave Finland um, um, and uh, being uh, uh, torn away from 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 his family and and, and society and so on. So. Um, in my article, I, I try to look at these different uh, different ways in which uh, the, this uh, uh, experience of migration shaped his thinking. Um, but yeah, that's 
sort of in a in a nutshell uh what's my article uh about okay thank you alexi and uh, next up is then Matt Wikström. So Matt, please, if you have a PowerPoint, you can share. Yes, share thank you. Thank you, Matthias. And start whenever you want to. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yes, here we are with my chapter in the book. And my name is Mats Wikström. And I'm also a project researcher in history or at the history department at Obo Academy University. And at the moment, my main research interest is different aspects of Finland, Swedish minority nationalism, which of course also has been one of the things that we have looked at quite thoroughly, I would say, in the class struggle in Swedish project. But now to my article or chapter in the book, which is probably the most biographical text in the book. And it's about a Finland Swedish proletarian and lifelong communist called Allan Asplund. And Allan Asplund was born in the Hanko Peninsula, which some of you might be familiar with. Uh, Hange is the name of the city in Swedish, and it's the southernmost point of mainland Finland. And he was born into a poor working class family. His uh, father died when he, he was very young, and his mother, who also became a communist, like most other members of the family, uh, did her best to, to support, support the family as a single mother. And uh, he was born into a time of social and political upheaval in the Russian Empire, Finland, as you probably know, as a part of the Russian Empire uh, at this time. And, and this upheaval, of course, also affected Finland. We will not get into that, but tensions grew, social and political tensions grew. And after the declaration of independence, the independence of Finland, that is, uh, the tensions erupted into a civil war between Reds, socialists, and whites, bourgeois, and other, yes, let's call it that. This was a a very terrible and bloody war. And in Alan Asplund's hometown, Alan Asplund was at this, uh, Alan Asplund's brothers joined the Reds, his uh, older brothers, two of them. And uh, the Reds uh, held Hange, the city where the, the Asplund family lived. They took, took Hange easily and held Hange. Uh, it was under red control until one of the then or a pivotal moment occurred in both the, the war and and also then Alan Dasplund's life. And that was the, the the landing of German troops in Hanko on April 3rd, 1918. And the picture the picture here is of that moment, and as you can see, these are some serious and numerous German troops who are marching into, into Hanko. And the, the Reds of Hanko uh, left the, the, the city without a fight to retreat. And they, the Reds retreated and retreated uh, before, the, okay, they took one fight at least in, in, in my old hometown, Karis, but the it only took, took uh, 10 days for the Germans to land in Hanko and then move into Helsinki and, and take it and defeat the Reds in Helsinki. So Helsinki was liberated by the Germans 
and not by Mannerheim's army. You might be familiar with the, with the white leader Mannerheim. And this was a very tra traumatic event for, for Alan Dastund and, and most certainly also for his, for his family, which you can read more about in, in, the, in my article. Also because the, the, the elder, the, both of the elder brothers of Alan Dastund, they survived the war, but they were put into, into the, the red prison camps of the whites where they starved. And also his, his uncle, his, one of his uncles died at, at one of the prison camps for the Reds and so forth. So a couple of years after the civil war, the, the socialists or the, in, in, in Hanko regrouped and turned to communism. And the, 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 the big brothers were probably instrumental in also uh, bringing Alan Asplund along into then communism in Finland. Yes. So Alan Asplund was a, 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 a working man, a working boy. And he, he worked in, in different factories in, in Hanko and also here where I am right now in Turku, Obu. And he was active in the, in the, in the, in the then left socialist, nominally left socialist movement of Finland. And he, he wrote, he, he started writing, writing small pieces, uh, reports from the, from the field, so to say. Into, into the left socialist papers. And this, his writing skills, I assume, it was the writing skills, but probably perhaps also other factors that I'm unaware of, they caught the eye of, 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 of the, the, the main leader of the left socialist or communist uh, Finland Swedish branch of the labor movement in Finland. And, and that leader was Jakob August or J. Aug, as he called himself in writing at least, Isaacson, who was a, a member of parliament and also the editor in chief of Nya Folkbladet in Vasa. And Nya Folkbladet was the, was the paper of the Finland Swedish extreme left, if we would want to call it that. So, Isaacson called the young Alan Asplund to Vasa to become his apprentice at the, at the paper, Nya Folkbladet, because uh, Isaacson was a very, very busy man. He, was, he, he did everything. And he also, he, 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 he burned out because of this and, 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 and died of a heart attack. But Isaacson needed someone to, to edit the paper when he was away, for instance, in Helsinki as a, as a member of parliament. So the young Alan Aspin moved to Vasa and became a newspaper man, an agitator. And here we have him. Uh, in, in 1928, he, he, he became a, formally became a member of, of, of the Communist Party of Finland who was based in, 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 in the Soviet Union, uh, also with, with underground work, of course, in, in Finland and, and fronts, different fronts in Finland, and also with a, a, a very active office in Stockholm, Sweden. Yes, but let's get back to Alan Asplund. So he becomes a newspaper man, and here we have him. He, you can see he's the youngest and perhaps a young, handsome man, and uh, and here is he is pictured with with uh, with Finnish newspaper colleagues, the editors of of, of 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 Finnish left socialist or communist papers, who were all published or printed in in Vasa. So uh, yes, so he was he was he was only he was very young because Isaacson, as I said, died. 
died shortly or shortly after Alan had arrived in, in Vasa. So a very young man with a very challenging task. But in Vasa, he also he also became a member of the of the left socialist Finland Swedish community there, which was a very thriving and and ac active socialist community. And, and and Vasa was in practice the the, the capital of left socialist or communist. Uh, Swedish-speaking Finland, because Vasa had the the socialists of Vasa had been spared in the civil war, or not spared, but the uh, circumstances uh, the, the the circumstances circumstances spared them. Let, let's put it like that. You can read more about it in in the in the article. And the activities were centered in 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 Folketshus in Vasa, and there. Osplund gained many friends, many comrades, and also met his future wife, Jarda Osplund, a young socialist girl who, who worked as a, as a waiter and, and other things at Folketshus. Yes, and uh, one of the reasons I wanted to write about Alan Osplund is because uh, of course, I wanted to showcase biographically a Finland-Swedish communist, which has not perhaps been uh, done in, in, in the manner that I have done previously. But more importantly, Alan Osplund's life, communist life, is very intertwined with the with the politic with the with the political history of the communist movement in Finland. As, as, as I already told you, uh, the, the civil war was, of course, a pivotal moment, which it was for the whole of the labor movement in Finland. And, and as a consequence of the civil war, the, the fin, fin, Finnish communism was, was established. And uh, Finnish communism also suffered a, a huge blow. Uh, in 1930, due to the due to the rise of the the far right, or, or one could all, or say fascist Lapua movement, which you might have heard of, who who, who through terrorism and, and and mass meetings and also a march on Helsinki, uh, forced the government, who, who was not unwilling, to enact the so-called communist laws which banned, completely banned communism, which was banned of course already, but banned everything associated also with communism in Finland. And Alan, Alan Osmond was in the middle of this far-right terrorism. He, 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 he was, was beaten badly in Vasa when the Lapua movement had a, uh, instigated a, a, a riot there, an anti-communist riot. You can read about the details. And, and the twists and turns concerning this in, in, the, in, the, in the article. But not, not only was Alan Dasblund beaten, they also, the, the, the Lapua men also attacked his wife and, and, and other socialists. Uh, the the New York Folkbladet, the, the, the paper for which he was editor in chief, was shut down. So Alan Dasplund was an unemployed communist newspaper man and an activist in, in a country where, where, where anti-communism was, was the rule, the law of the land. So he took, he, Alan and, and, and Yerda also had a son in 1929. So he took his family or the family moved back to, to Hanko where he kept a low profile and, and, and worked worked as a fisherman and, and, other, and other odd jobs. Kept a low profile for a couple of years until he again became active in the communist, underground communist movement in Finland. And 
this this ultimately led to him being imprisoned uh, during the continuation war uh, that that is the, the the Finland's war against the Soviet Union after the winter war when Finland was allied with Nazi Germany and attacked the Soviet Union to to take back Karelia and also in the in the names of the 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 many Finnish nationalists to to create a, a greater Finland. So before the, the Finnish army attacked the Soviet Union, Alan Asplund and many other communists and social democrats, also the, the Karl Harald Wick, whose Matthias is an expert on, were imprisoned. And uh, Alan Asplund was imprisoned in, 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 in various internment camps in, in Karelia. And, and and was a, was a, was forced to work there under very harsh circumstances and many of the imprisoned communists died in the camps they were not these camps were not extermin they were they were not extermination camps but of course the 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 the, the motive to keep the, the the communists alive was not that great so many succumbed and this is also one of the reasons Alan Dusman caught my eye because Directly after the war, uh, Alan wrote a book about his experiences in these camps uh, called Uplevelser i Finska Concentrationsläger, Experiences in Finnish Concentration Camps. And this is one aspect that I have not explored as much as I would have liked, but for some reason, uh, this book was published in Sweden by federatives, which I believe now, I don't remember, I, I believe it's a, perhaps a syndicalist uh, publishing company. I, uh, and it was, uh, it, it was published in Finland uh, roughly 10 years ago. So it took a while for the book to be published in Finland, in, uh, in both Swedish and Finnish here in Finland. And it was the first of its kind. Uh, in the 50s, from the 50s onwards, many Finnish communists started publishing books about, uh, about their experiences as political prisoners and about uh, anti-communist oppression. But Alan Asplund was then a pioneer in, in, in this regard, but, but he, he didn't get any attention in Finland uh, for his, his, his book. And, it's it's a, it's a great read and i rely heavily on this book in my article when 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 describing his his time in the camps yes and the experiences they laid heavily on on alan Asplund. he was he was pretty much a broken man after after his 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 internment but he only he only took a couple of, of weeks to recuperate in hanko of course he went home directly after he was freed the soviet union basically freed him from the camps after finland lost the lost the war and and, and immediately this is also very interesting but i i haven't he immediately returned to communist activism and again then as a newspaper man and he, he moved to Helsinki to become the become an editor of of of, of Nytid, who was the the paper of the people's democrats a left socialist communist alliance in, in one of the biggest parties in in, in post war finnish politics and this was Nytid was then the the the, the swedish speaking paper of the people's democrats and he he worked with he worked alan dasplin made sure that that new deed it had it was also called other things but that new deed came out he he was the main man uh, in 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 publishing the, the paper even though he he, he was editor in chief only only for a very brief period so Communism for Alan Asplund, it was, it was what he did, it was his life. 
And here's a picture of Alan Dasplund uh, in the 50s, I believe. I, I, it's, it's undated, the picture, uh, it, from, from a, a, a meeting of, of Finland, Swedish people's Democrats, m most of them communists. And yeah, middle-aged Alan Dasplund. And I, I am, of course, biased and, and probably prone to projection, but I see a kind of thousand yard stare in his eyes. But that might just be me. And I haven't done any visual analysis in the, in the chapter either. But, but he, he, he and, and, and he died when, when, when working with the, with the print of, of, of Nutid. So he died on his feet working with his, his final paper. Yes, uh, but please read more about Alan Dasplund in, in a very concise manner in, in my, my article. Yes, and that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mats. And then we will take the last presentation for today. It's Yasmin, and Yasmin has also a PowerPoint and can start when you are ready. Yeah, can, you can hear me now. Okay, all right. Hi, my name is Yasmin and I'm a doctoral candidate at the Comparative Literature Department at Åbo Academy. Uh, and I have written one of the articles in the anthology that we are discussing today. And uh, the name of the article is uh, The Religion of Bread and Humanity, Socialism, Belief and Doubt in Leo Ågren's Kungsådan Triology, especially Fedren's Blood, which is the third part of that book, that, that book series. And uh, my research interest revolve, revolves around questions of social class and how these are expressed in literature and mainly then in, uh, the, in the, the literature of two Finnish Swedish 20th century authors, uh, Anna Bundestam and then Leo Ogren, who this article is about. And uh, it was in this capacity I took part in this in this project, Class uh, Campus Venska. Um, Leo Ogren, why is this not? <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, Leo Ogren was an author who was mainly active during the 1950s and 60s. Uh, there's probably some of you who are, who are familiar with his brother, Jösta Ogren one of the biggest contemporary poets in Finland. He recently passed away, uh, winner of the Finlandia Prize, among other things. And uh, Jösta and Leo, uh, they came from quite a special family uh, out of seven siblings. Four eventually became authors. Um, the family lived under dire circumstances in uh, like crofters, uh, that is in Swedish bakstugusittare, uh, someone who lives in a small house and doesn't have enough land to live on. Uh, so quite quite a harsh, harsh upbringing. Uh, also in this uh, Ostrobotnia part of Finland in a little, a little village called Lipjär um, in the north of Finland that Alexi already already talked about this, this, this part of the country. Um, Leo was only attending four years in school until he had to quit to help financing the family economy. And uh, despite the economic and social challenges, the children had quite a cultural upbringing and uh, there was a big love for literature in the household. Uh, how, and they, they, all, they often uh, pointed out that their mother Olga's passion for reading as a big reason for them becoming authors, and also, also at least, uh, Jösta has brought up brought up that also it was like a road that was that was possible if you wanted to have an intellectual profession but didn't have the possibility of getting a long education, then then it was natural to become a writer that way. Um, and Leo Ogren strongly connected his socialist convictions 
uh, with his childhood experience of poverty. Uh, in an interview from 1960, he says that socialism is the only possibility for him, uh, considering what he went through in his childhood. Uh, and his first novel, Hunger in Shirdetid, from 1954, in English, something like uh, Hunger in Harvest Time, uh, was partly autobiographic, bi biographical, and it describes in sketch-like episodes uh, the everyday life of an eight-year-old boy uh, living in a poor family of crofters in the ha first half of the 20th century. Uh, the main character's name, Jan, is mainly considered to be a homage to one of Leo's uh, literary heroes, Jan Friedegård, Swedish proletarian writer. Mm, and also this first novel was very strongly marketed by the publishing house as a proletarian novel and Leo Ogren as a proletarian writer of the fin Finland-Swedish community, the first one. Uh, and it was no secret that his like, big favorite authors uh, came from the Swedish so-called Statarskola, apart from Fridegård also, Harry Martinsson and Ivar Johansson. Uh, he was also a big fan of the poet Dan Andersson. Um, after his first novel, uh, Ogren published the second one, Mootsuls, Counterclockwise, uh, that was written in the same spirit. And after that, he wrote his magnum opus, uh, a historic trilogy where he traces the class struggle of a family of poor and ill-fated ill tenant farmers through generations, starting from the 18th century and ending up in the Finnish Civil War in 1918. Uh, the books were named uh, Kung's Odern, The King Wayne, uh, Narguda Nadur, When the Gods Die, and Fedren's Blood, The Blood of the Fathers. Um, interesting, inter interestingly enough, the trilogy was published at the same time as Vainalinna's canonical historical trilogy about the same subject, Talapohjan Tähden Alla, uh, here beneath the North Star in English. Seemingly a mere coincidence, but, but the enormous shadow that Linna's trilogy cast might had, ha have had an impact on how, how Leo's trilogy was perceived by the critics. Uh, oh, Leo Ogren was an active member in both the Finnish People's Democratic League and in the local peace association in Jakobstad, where he lived at the time and worked as a typesetter for the local newspaper. And he often called himself a socialist. But his relationship to socialism was not unproblematic. Uh, he seems to have had a deep-rooted skepticism against any idea that claimed to be all-encompassing. And he was very conscious about the underlying risks of giving in to an ideology. Uh, in the same interview that I referred to earlier, Ogren also states that he actually hates politics and that socialism is too often perceived as religion or philosophy. For him, socialism seems to have been a strictly material matter, a struggle for better, better living standards for ordinary people, which for him was mainly than workers and poor farmers. And this ambivalence towards the socialist ideas is something that Ogren explores in this trilogy. And in my article, I'm, I argue that he does this through using the concept of religious belief, both as a parallel and as a contrast. Uh, when Ogren wrote these novels in the end of the 1950s and the be in the beginning of the 60s, uh, ideas about secularizations were, secularization were dominating themes in both the academic and the public discussion. Uh, according to these ideas, religious belief was regard regarded as a phenom phenomenon that did not have a place in modern society and therefore naturally would fade away over time. Uh, when it comes to research in the workers' movement and its 20th century history, these ideas often led to religious aspects of working class uh, life being looked upon as peripheral phenomena, exceptions from the dominating atheistic mainstream and mainly ascribed to women and people from the countryside. Uh, in this context, questions about the relationship between socialism and religion were conceived as irrelevant and uninteresting, uh, even though research already then had suggested that the, er that the early socialist movement and also the sobriety movement rhetorically as well as structurally were based on a form created by religious institutions and carried, carried in them a worldview strongly influenced by a really religious way of thinking. 
uh, later research in social history and working class history has re-evaluated re the role of religion in the early 20th century society. And today it is perceived as an organic part of the society of that day. Uh, but the Kung Sodan triology is characterized very much by anti-clericalism. That is a movement that is opposed to religious institutions, uh, institutional power and influence in public and political life. And this is quite typical for the, for the proletarian literature of that time, I believe. Uh, the church is depicted as supporters of the oppressing rulers, and the priests are either selfish and inscrupulous and taking advantage of their menials, or then they are just stupid and misled. Uh, and the institutions in power, namely the king and the county, ad county administration, are cooperating with the church in order to oppress the people in these novels. Uh, one might think that this kind of anti-clericalism anti would lay the ground for quite a black and white depiction of religious belief, but and many times the, and this anti-clericalism also has been uh, perceived as anti-religiosity. But let me quote, uh, the human being, and especially the Ostrobotnian human being, has a religious nature. Religion affects our lives in one way or the other, from cradle to grave. Nobody can reach the mature, a mature age without being influ influenced by religious concept. Um, this is what Leo Ogren wrote in an editorial in the local newspaper Jakobstad Stiening, uh, under the headline of The Morale of Jehovah. Uh, having grown up in the Swedish-speaking part of Ostrobotnia in the north of Finland, uh, where there was a strong free church tradition, he might have felt the acuteness of these questions stronger than other, others, but Ogren's actions must still be considered as a kind of animality in a time when these questions were highly unfashionable, both in the intellectual and the socialist circles. Uh, in, the in the text, Ogren declared himself an atheist, uh, which not surprisingly stirred up a major storm of debate. But the editorial was actually not oppressed to op opposed to religion as such, even if it was interpreted in that way by many. Uh, instead, it showed an openness and an interest in religious matters. And Ogren even called the question of God's existence the big question and suggested that it actually should be the most pressing issue in the so-called cultural discussion. And the chief editor at the time, Anders Huldén, actually called Leo Ogren, a searcher. Uh, and I was also surprised myself that my article, when I wrote it, came to revolve so much around religious beliefs. Uh, I didn't see that coming when I started out with the aim of examining how socialism is depicted in the trilogy. Uh, perhaps my own academic thinking also has been quite influenced by secularization ideas. But in, when I read the trilogy, it was quite impossible not to notice how much space issues about faith and religion took uh, the name of the second parties after all, when the gods die. And uh, my article was somehow born out of this awareness that what at first glance looks like anti-religiosity actually is an in-depth analysis of the mechanisms of faith, uh, be it sacral or socialist or other. In Fedran's Blood, the last part of the trilogy that takes place during the Finnish Civil War, Rolf Eriksson, the main character who is a socialist and fighting on the red side in the war, calls socialism the religion of bread and humanity. And I think that captures something essential in my understanding of Ogren's perception of socialism. And I think it's, it's, it, this, this perception also is reflected in many other uh, ways in the trilogy. A complete dedication to socialism can, like fanatical religious belief, take over your existence and push away the material and the human aspects of life that it originally was set to guard. Is it the big words that have become gods and require sacrifice? Asks Eriksson, when the white and red rhetorical warfare was at its worst in a Finland torn apart by civil war. At the same time, faith is never fully discarded. Uh, but it's also put, portrayed as a source of strength in difficult times, like when Eriksson and his comrades from the local workers' union are sitting locked inside the clubhouse waiting for their execution. Through singing the international together, they manage to collect strength 
and a sense of belonging that makes them able to meet their destiny with open eyes and calm knowledge of their own position. So the tension between, on the one hand, the positive and negative power that is built into a belief, and on the other hand, on the double-sidedness of socialism as partly a material matter and partly an ideological one, is what I perceive as the driving force of the triology. And this is what I try to capture in my article. Yeah. So, thanks. Thank you very much, Yasmin. And this was all three presentations.